everybody. Uh, we are your hosts. Super excited to be with you for this session. My name is Sammy and I am a singer in a band called Soulbox and I live in what I would probably say is the best place to be. You know, we're in the north, we're in Manchester. It's happening, it's popping, it's great. Incorrect. And my name is T, I'm a rapper from London, which we obviously know is the best place to be. Mm -hmm. uh, I produce as well, and today we're gonna to be engaging our brains going deeper, talking about race, culture, and faith. Amazing, so I thought that we should kickstart this session by talking about diversity. Uh, so what do you think diversity means? So there's so many different things that people can think diversity is, right? It's actually this huge topic. And I went out on the street and asked some different people what they thought diversity is. Diversity is the joining of different groups of people who you might not na uh, naturally put together. When you don't just have one kind of person, but actually you've got all kinds of different people. In a group, of, like in a, in a room, a group of people who are like come from different shapes, different backgrounds, different ethnic, all together as one and just doing things together and there's no separation, no segregation or anything, just everyone just togetherness. That makes sense. To me, diversity is to include lots of different people from any kind of background and just not judge because of who they are. According to Merriam-Webster, diversity is the condition of having or being composed of different elements, variety especially. The inclusion of different types of people, such as people of different races or cultures in a group or an organisation. As we grow in the 21st century, it's easy to take for granted that we live in a society that has more access to more cultures than ever before in history. The advancement of technology means that we can come across people with completely different heritages, experiences and cultures than our own. Now, this may not seem to be the case when you're growing up, but let's take a step back and have a look at some of the stats so we know exactly how culturally diverse our community in the UK is. Every 10 years, a census is taken, which records the numbers and demographics of the people in the country. The first census to include ethnicity was 1991, where 93% of the country defined itself as white British, only 7% defining itself in the non-white category. Now compare that with the most recent census in 2011, where that 7% has doubled to 14%, and we can see that the country is way more diverse now than it has been. And when you look at London specifically, that diversity is even more apparent with 55% of Londoners defining themselves in the non-white categories. That's around 4.5 million out of 8.2 million in London alone. There's over 200 languages spoken and a third of Londoners are foreign born. So we can see that we live in a really diverse community and we believe that's a good thing. Cultures open up the world to us they help us experience places and times that we wouldn't otherwise get the chance to. Living in a diverse community not only teaches us that the world is bigger than what's on our doorstep, it also helps us to explore new things and add them to our day-to-day -day lives. I know what you're thinking, you may just be thinking this is just talk, right? So we're going to do a little exercise to prove how much living in a diverse community benefits us in our day-to-day -day lives. Here's the thing, a lot of the stuff that we use come from all over the world and we just don't know it. So I thought I'd go out and about today and ask some people where they think some famous foods, brands, cars, whatever it may be, I wanted to find out where people think these things come from. So let's find out what they had to say. First one, Adidas. UK? America, right? No, 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 no. I don't even know, wow. Okay, I don't know. What is it? America? I think that comes from Germany. Germany? Wow. I didn't even know that. Yes, That's crazy. Pizza. Italy? Italy. I'd say that comes from Italy. Italy? That's Come on. Correct. Pizza is indeed a tie. Mine are. Tie, like a tie that you wear around your neck. That's UK. Uh, I don't know. France. I have no idea. Poland? France? 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 Yeah. France. See? That's amazing. That's good. Coffee. Mm. Like Brazil? Coffee, coffee, coffee. It's not from Europe. It's, um, can we say Asia? China or India? Coffee. No, I think I'm, oh, Mexico. Does that come from Italy as well? Ethiopia. Oh, wow. Oh, wow. Nando's. America. Portugal and South Africa. I would say, like, India. 
Like Portugal or somewhere over there? Yeah, that's actually correct. It's Portugal, nice. but originated in South Africa. Oh, that's cool. Ketchup. Ketchup from Italy. <laughs> that come off it's from somewhere in Africa. Ketchup sounds like a European thing because of all the sugar. So I'm saying, I'm saying Netherlands. <laughs> I don't know. UK. Chinese. Whoa. From China. That's crazy. Tea. India. Is it India? China. In China? In yeah, India? it is. You really? Yeah, Chinese. Tesco. I ain't got a clue. Is it, is it the States? England? German? England? Uh, the UK. No. No. Polish founder. Wow. Uh, Mini. Mini Cuba. You know, I found out, I did some little research. Apparently it's from Greece, not from the UK. The UK. Mini Cooper is British. Greek slash Turkey. Oh, I've got to be that. No, real. no. <laughs> and the last one, fish and chips. Well, you would think the UK. Is that right? Uh, Spain. Fish and chips have to be from England or UK. Oh, no. Yeah. India. What? what? UK? France? Germany? Europe? Oh, wait, no, Greece. Okay, I'm bad. Sorry, guys. Is that UK? A lot of people would think so. Oh, no. It's <laughs> not. Okay, well, it's not. Where is it from? It's mad. See, when it comes to fish and chips, what we can take credit for as Brits is bringing battered fish and chips together. We can take all the credit for that. But the battered fish was introduced to us by Jewish refugees who were coming from Portugal and Spain. And the chips that we love were introduced to us by a Belgian woman. So the answer is, when it comes to fish and chips, it was a diverse mix, see what I did there, from Jews that were coming from Portugal and Spain and a Belgian lady and us Brits bringing it together. It's so so incredible to see um, what happens when there is diversity. How incredible is it to hear what diversity is all about? So clearly, each one of us benefits every day from living in a community that has many cultures. And it's a good thing, right? As Christians especially, we believe that God created the whole world and everyone in it. That's you and that's me. All colours and cultures were made by and are loved by God. The Bible is the book that Christians read which explains who God is and who we are. We really believe that God created us to be in a diverse community. So T, if there are so many pluses to living in a diverse community, why is it that some cultures have such an awful experience? So we don't have to look beyond the summer of 2020 for examples of injustice against people that are from cultures in the minority. We regularly hear horrible stories like that of a man going for a jog in his local neighbourhood and being shot by people who are yelling racial slurs. Or a woman who's asleep in her own house and is shot to death by police who didn't knock or give a warning. Or even a man who was standing on the side of the road and ended up being killed by a policeman kneeling on his neck until he couldn't breathe. The murders of Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor and George Floyd all point to a system that doesn't value all members of the community, specifically because of their race and culture. And you can look at stories like that of Stephen Lawrence, a young black boy who was walking home and was beaten to death by a gang of young white people to see it happening in the UK too. And when we look at the experiences of certain minorities, and in this case, black people, they can have a very negative experience of a community that shares so much of its culture. And we wanna find out why that is so that we can learn how we can live in a community where every culture is respected and appreciated, not just for what we can get from it, but for the people who create it. So, let's deal with the problem straight on, racism. In order to understand and deal with injustice being done to particular groups and races, we need to be able to detail exactly what the issue is, where it came from, and how it affects us day to day. I'm gonna ask my mate Ben, who's in Soulbox, to define what racism is for us. So Ben, what is racism? According to dictionary.com, racism is defined as prejudice, discrimination or antagonism by an individual, community or institution against a person or people on the basis of their membership of a particular racial or ethnic group, typically one that is a minority or marginalised. So basically, any time someone is treated unfairly because of their race, then that's racism. We're going to take a look at the history of racism against black people so that we can understand how it affects us all. 
So through school, the internet, or our friends, all of us have been exposed to certain facts about the history of racism, specifically the slave trade. But we don't often discuss what actually happened and why, and how it directly links to us today. So let's talk about it. First things first, slavery has existed all throughout history in some way, shape or form. When we talk about slavery now, we're usually referring to the transatlantic slave trade, which took place from the 15th century to the 19th century. What makes this iteration of slavery stand out in history is this. It's the first, largest and only instance of an entire people group being moved from one continent to another solely for the purpose of enslaving. While countries had tribal slaves and prisoners of war, there was no other time in history that we see this many people being moved from one place to another. At that number, it's estimated anywhere between a few million to a hundred million. These people were dispersed across Europe and the Americas with the abolition of slavery happening in the UK in 1833. Now in the 400 years of the transatlantic slave trade, it was just accepted by the majority of people that this is how things are and should be. Sociologists like George Herbert Mead and Zygmunt Bowman say that society is understood through similarities and differences. Basically, we know who we are because we know who we aren't. Creating an understanding about the nature of people who aren't us helps us to come to terms with such a horrible thing. The problem is this though, that thinking of they and us continued way after slavery was abolished. Though there was a public acceptance that black people should be treated as humans, there still wasn't the belief that they should be treated as equals. And as numbers of people from Afro-Caribbean countries immigrated to the UK, that they and us thinking has resulted in subtle forms of racism being ingrained across our society, where the experience of black people in Britain is seen as second to the experience of white British people. Now here's a personal story from Mr. Norman Mitchell about his experience when he came over to the country as part of the Windrush generation. Well, Norman, it's my absolute pleasure uh, to have you in the studio today. I'm very excited to hear about your journey coming to the UK. So why don't you start by telling us which country are you from? I'm from Jamaica. So Norman, you're saying um, England opened up and there was an opportunity for you to come here. What had you heard about England. What had you heard about England before you came here? What was it that made you decide that you would travel? Well, to when Africa? we was at school as children, we used to to learn that England streets are paved with gold, and London is built upon the Thames. So that was a big interest of coming to see the street paved with gold. I can imagine. I can imagine. So you thought you really thought that the streets were paved with gold. <laughs> we well, we get that in history. Okay. So you were told the streets were paved with gold. You were told that London was built on on the Thames, uh, and so you wanted to come and find some of that gold, right? That's right. <laughs> so tell us now. Fast forward. Uh, what was it like when you came to the UK? How did you arrive and where did you first well, land? It was quite different when I came to UK because we came in five o'clock on a Sunday morning and the boat did not come straight to the dock because it was a very large boat. It docked out in the sea and a ferry boat should come to take us off. The ferry boat said they won't pay to take us out. But the men from Kingston, they stand up on their feet and they said, we are not going to pay no more money because we have already paid our fare to London. So they never take us off the boat until two o'clock. So when we came off two o'clock, there was three train waiting for us. And um, after catch the train from Plymouth, mm -hmm. on my way coming up and looking through the window, I see these large chimneys 
part of Panitaba. And I was wondering why they have so many boiling houses here. <laughs> boiling houses, like factory houses. You thought That's factory, factory houses. yes. Yeah. Boiling houses where we make sugar. So that's the only place we used to see chimney. So I said, why they are having so many chimney in this country? So you've arrived at Plymouth, you've paid your fate fair to get here. Yourself and all of the other men from Kingston refused to pay any more money to go onto the ferry. How much had you paid in the first place? What was your fare to the UK? My fare was 75 pounds from Jamaica. So Dad, can you tell me uh, what it was like um, to find housing and accommodation. What was it like when you first came to the UK? It was a little difficult in those days to find because when you see a notice put out on a notice board or on a tree or somewhere, you will, the first thing you'll see, you'll see no Irish, no black, no dogs. So you are timid if you to go and knock on the door to ask if there is a vacant or any room to rent. Because, because the sign said it, no blacks, no Irish, no dogs. Because there was no, on the notice board, no black, no Irish, no dogs. Wow. So Norman, when you did find accommodation though, um, I understand that there wasn't lots of space. Tell us what that was like. <laughs> the space was very, very small. I had a bed. <laughs> And my bed, my bed that I had, when I lay down in it, if I'm deterred, I have to get up and <laughs> So, are you saying the bed was so small? Yes, it, it was narrow. <laughs> if I turned, if I tried to turn on the bed, I fell off. <laughs> wow. So, so I had to sit up and turn and then lay down again. <laughs> Wow, so you had a very small bed. What about how many other people were occupying the space? Well, in that room, it was seven of us. Seven? Seven people, seven men. Seven men? Yes. In one room? Three and one bed, three and one, and I was on a little one. <laughs> so sometimes there were three people to any one bed? Three people, yeah. <laughs> and were these people that you knew? Were they people that you travelled with, or were they just people? No, 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 no. no people that travel on their own different time. So you were basically bedding down but, with strangers? But um, when they hear about a, a space, they try to get it. Mm. At those days, you couldn't ask for a room. You had to ask if there's any space in. Wow. So what were the facilities like then? It was very tough. But the one thing, the men were jolly at it. They didn't first they didn't worry they didn't bother everybody no wall no wall drawer was in the room no dressing table we had to keep our case underneath the bed <laughs> with all your clothes in <laughs> yeah my days like that is mad what an incredible story i mean shout out mr mitchell you are an incredibly like inspirational man and thank you for sharing your story with us uh we're gonna move on to talk about prejudice and discrimination and i'm gonna have my mate john who's also in soulbox shout out soulbox massive uh, to define what that means so john what is prejudice and discrimination Yes, everybody, John here from Soulbox. Hope you're doing really, really well. Hope you're enjoying your time in school and hope you're finding this lesson a total and a survive. I'm going to tell you some definitions from home. As you can see, I'm in the comfort of my own home and I'm going to bring some definitions right to you now. So the definition of prejudice is a preconceived opinion that is not based on reason or actual experience. And the definition of discrimination is the unjust or prejudicial treatment of different categories of people, especially on the grounds of race, age, sex or disability. So these definitions say that racism is a way that people form an opinion or an idea of a person or group and then act on it. So you see, this leads us to trust that our way of seeing things is the truth of the matter, which is how you can create notions and ideas about people that aren't true. That's how you can act unfairly towards someone and completely justify it in your own head. And when a whole group of people refuses to see outside of themselves, that's when it's easy to justify something so horrible as the slave trade. 
That drive to satisfy ourselves ahead of any and everyone else is what we as Christians call sin. We believe that sin is what has such a negative effect on us, both individually and in our society, because it makes us focus on ourselves ahead of everyone else. And because we believe God created us to be in a diverse community where we enjoy and respect each other, we can see how that's completely undone when we put ourselves first, because it stops us and our ability to trust people we spend our time with. This is in all of us. So T, where do we go from here? Like mentioned before, in the Bible, we see who God is and who we are in relation to him. But when we look at the big story that goes through the whole Bible, we see a creative, life-giving God create a beautiful world with humans right at the center. The Bible says that we were created to be in a relationship with God, to mirror his creativity and to fill the entire earth. But as with any real relationship, you have to choose for yourself if you want to be in it. You can't force someone to love you. So God gave humans a choice. Follow him and what he says is good or decide for yourself. And we humans chose then and we choose every day to define good for ourselves and to not follow God. This rejection of God is what the Bible calls sin. And sin separates us from God and from each other. The problem here is that if I decide something is good for me and it isn't good for someone else, we end up fighting over what is good. And this spiral ends us up in fractured communities where we can't trust each other. Sin makes us dehumanize each other, and that's the problem. But there is a rescue plan. His name is Jesus. See, Jesus wasn't just a man. As Christians, we believe Jesus to be God in flesh, coming to the world to walk with us. You see, we believe that our sin separates us from God and leads us to death. But check this out, Jesus lives a perfect life, a life that we can never live, and then he dies in our place. The debt for our sin is paid off. But the story doesn't end there. See, we believe as Christians that he rose again three days later, and we believe anyone who believes in him will have a true life restored into a relationship with God, making it possible to see ourselves the same as God sees us and enabling us to not devalue others. So how do we respond to this? First and foremost, we have to individually analyze our own prejudices. Spend time thinking about our life and our times and whether we've experienced, perpetrated or witnessed racism or prejudice. Ask yourself about it. What did you do? What would you do now? What effect has it had on you? Secondly, we have to change the assumptions that we make daily. Most of these issues thrive when we unconsciously project our experience onto everything we see. Building an understanding of what is normal in your life but not projecting that onto others is key to opening ourselves to new experiences being just as valid as our own. We have to be willing to unlearn what we assume is okay because it may be offensive to other people. We have to be willing to listen to what people say and if they say they're offended, we can't respond from a place of defensiveness but an openness and understanding of their experience. And finally, a really practical step we can take is that for each bit of culture you take, take some history too. Every song you listen to, check where it comes from, who wrote it, what inspired them. Every item of clothing you wear, see how it was made and what it traditionally means. Check the context around everything we enjoy as to educate yourself on these experiences. This will continue to build an understanding and appreciation for different cultures around us. Allow me to share something I swear is true. That which we don't know impacts people as much as that which we do. You've heard this, ignorance is bliss. Yes, but for the powerful and privileged, creating cultural prejudice and infinite systems built upon foundations that are unjust for those that have to live in our unwillingness to shift perspective and consciousness. Stay with me. Ignorance is problematic because its impact is systematic and it's always stacked against the less fortunate who get traumatized and caught in it, fighting wars with no reward in it just because I had never thought of it like that. Ignorance is dangerous. If you reverse your car without looking backwards and you hit a stranger and you find them paralyzed, laid out on the pavement, it wasn't their fault for not knowing the time you would drive off. It was your fault for not looking back and checking your blind spot. Take me for example, educated 
and yet unaware that my entire life I've benefited from a system that was never fair. My skin color makes me different. It's advantageous to be white if when you're not, there are cultural connotations that minimize your rights. Don't believe me? Look at my family tree and tell me where recently someone was sold as a product legally. I mean traded like cattle, kidnapped and then trafficked. Now imagine being asked to act like that never happened when it's recent history. It was only 1833 the anti-slavery bill came to be and that was 300 years after we started selling humans from Bristol, Plymouth, Liverpool and London harbors. So we're still living in the shadow of a cultural disaster with generational dispositions etched into our psychological rafters. But it's 2020 and times have changed. Not when black people have been free less time than they were enslaved and we don't get to set the date the conversation gets erased. We just get to set the date in which we change. It's not enough to say, I'm not racist. When we still benefit from the same systems that built the slave ships, we have to unlearn what they gave us. We have to reread history's pages. We have to be quiet enough to hear the voices we've silenced and contained, it's everywhere. It's complex, yes, but it's basic. So let me make it blatant. This very poem I'm saying, my flow and my cadence, man, where do you think it came from? All our favorite music has its origin in slave songs. We need to just listen and stop defending our position. Take a second of reflection and revision. This is here. This is now. This is on the streets of Britain. I was three when they killed Stephen Lawrence. I was 22 when they went to prison. God said to Cain, I hear the blood of your brother crying out from the dust. May we be able to do the same. God, may it be the same with us. May we hear the voices of the afflicted the persecuted, the victim. May we be humble enough to listen. May we have the courage to make a difference. Shout out to Rennie Edo-Lodge and all that has been written to help us move from ignorance into movement and into mission. I know it's just the beginning, but I swear justice is winning and our future can be different if we repent for our sins and change the way that we act in the way that we grow. You can choose to look the other way, but as of this day, you can never again say that you didn't know. Check your blind spot. As we wind up, remember it only takes one person to bring change to a community. You are a world changer. You can bring that change. Remember the actions of Jesus and what it means to not devalue others, as well as the words of Jesus. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. I wanna challenge you guys, what would it look like in your school, in your community, to love your neighbor as you love yourself? If you've been affected by anything we talked about today, why not check out the mix.org or Childline? Listen, guys, thank you so much for being with us today. We've enjoyed it. Hope you've enjoyed it as well. And most of all, we hope that you've learned something and that you've been impacted by this session today. The conversation does not end here, so make sure that you check out my band at Soulbox Band on Instagram and on YouTube. You can also find our music on every streaming platform under Soulbox. Thank you guys so much for being with us today. We're going to leave you guys with the song Discrepancy by Soulbox. See you next time. Yeah. You changed my heart, you changed my heart, you changed my trajectory. Cause there's what I deserve and what I receive and that's a discrepancy. That's a discrepancy. That's a discrepancy. That's a discrepancy. Now all I know is that I want you next to me. I can't believe when I think about all of the times That I was so selfish and I was so willful
Nothing now, you are my everything. Gave me your heart now, I'm richer than ever. King, literally sinking in love. I'm in heaven, got you on my mind like 24/7. I've waited for you my whole life now, I'm ready. My heart is so heavy without you, I'm deadly. I put you first, not second. I reckon we're better together. And I wanna, I wanna be all in, sold out, life, love, no doubt. Cause you're my identity. You're my identity now, and I want to be all in, sold out, life, love, no doubt, cause you're my identity, your love was meant for me. You changed my heart, you changed my heart, you changed my trajectory, cause there's what I deserve and what I receive, and that's a discrepancy, that's a discrepancy. That's a discrepancy. That's a discrepancy. Now all I know is that I want you next to me. I get so big when I think about all of the times that I was so selfish. I must have been losing my mind. Cause there's a discrepancy. There's a discrepancy between where I was headed before that I met you and where I am gone. You changed my heart and then whispered, just let it be. You saw me out when my life was so messy. I've never been ready and never seen heaven reach into the depths of a heart. You set me free, defied expectancies when you selected me. So many times I've been ready to up and leave. You're the one for me. You sent your son for me. You kept on loving me. Now I just want to be all in. Slow down, light Cause you're my identity. You're my identity now. Sold out, no doubt, cause you're my identity. Your love is meant for me.